TFM. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Warp Five, our podcast dedicated to all things Star Trek Enterprise. I'm Christopher Jones, and with me, as always, is my esteemed co-host Matthew Rushing. Matthew, I I noticed you're wearing long sleeves today. Is there any reason for that? Uh, I mean, I'm, uh, why are you asking that, Chris? I feel kind of like no, I of course I just I I just felt a little bit chilly. Oh, that's all. Okay. I just noticed, you know, often you have your sleeves rolled up and I just thought maybe you're trying to cover something up today. Uh, I mean, no, not specifically. Why do you ask? (laughs) Well, I thought if you were, it would be very fitting because today we're going to talk about what I consider a very fun episode from the first season of Enterprise, wrist nipple. I I mean, unexpected. (laughs) So, this is the story where the Enterprise is going along. They feel like someone's trailing them. They finally detect another ship. We get cloaking technology for the first time here. And then Trip goes over to try to help them fix their ship. And he comes back pregnant. And then they have to find the ship again. And along the way, they encounter some Klingons. That's a quick summary of this episode. So, Matthew, why don't we just go ahead and jump in and talk about what really stands out first in this episode once Trip gets over to the ship, and that's the alien environment. I thought that was something that they did a nice job of in this episode, of of giving us something a bit different. Yeah, I agree. Um, one of the things I think that the alien environments really stand out, uh, and the reason that they stand out is that they feel so much like something from the original series. Oh, yeah, right. And I think that's the thing that I really love about uh, them is the fact that they they do. They feel like they came straight from many of the episodes you'd see uh, in TOS. And, And I think that's one of the reasons that I've always really gravitated towards this episode in the first place and really enjoyed it was because... It felt like in this first season, they were truly trying to hearken back to the experiences of that original series crew and kind of one up it in the sense of what we talked about, I think, in in the very first episode, which is this is the first time that you've been to any of these type of places. And so there's this wonder and joy, but also fear that we get with Trip experiencing this alien environment, trying to acclimate his body to the alien environment, almost in the same way. Like this kind of reminded me, and I wonder if they got the idea of visiting um, this this ship and, and the environment that these aliens normally live in uh, with the same way that you would if you were going to climb Everest. You know, you have to acclimate oh, yeah. at a certain height mm-hmm. uh, of, of uh, our planet so that you can actually find a way to get up the mountain. And uh, so mm-hmm. I, I wondered if they, they were specifically using that as an idea of the acclimation process and everything. And so, yeah, I mean, the entire episode, I was just struck by how much fun it was, but what a great job that they do with creating an environment that does feel very alien. It's like they weren't afraid to push it in that way, which was really cool. Yeah. Yeah, I like that they did this because it's interesting that you talk about TOS. I hadn't thought about that too much in preparing for this, but it is true that it feels a lot more like one of those environments that we might see in the original series. It got to the point on Star Trek through TNG DS9 Voyager to where like everybody breathes the same air. Mm-hmm. Everybody's ship is similar. You know, the bridge is in the same place. It has similar type of of workstations and control panels. And if you needed to go over to an alien ship, it wasn't that much different than right. going over to a Starfleet ship. It had gotten that feeling, which makes storytelling easier if mm-hmm. you've got 44, 42 minutes to tell a story and you don't want to spend a bunch of time 
delving into the differences, especially extreme differences like we have here, where you have to actually spend time in a, a like an airlock mm-hmm. acclimating yourself. So I get that, but it is a science fiction show. And so it would be nice to have a bit more variety. And I think it was really a must in Enterprise because you're telling the story of humans getting out there for the first time. Yep. And they're going to encounter things that truly are different. If they went out there and every ship they went over to felt kind of like the Enterprise, but a bit more advanced, Mm -hmm. I think that would have been a bit of a disappointment. And I also like the elements we get in here that are things that you might find in hard Mm sci-fi. If you're reading novels, things like food growing on the walls. I mean, how convenient would that be? To be able, you know, you just get hungry, you're in engineering, you got to pull an (sighs) all-nighter. Like, man, you want to go down to the mess hall after this, you know, and and grab a bite? I'm so hungry. And like, Mm -hmm. what are you talking about, dude? We've got food all over the walls. (laughs) So that was a nice thing. Grass on the bridge. I love Trip goes, it's even green. Is the grass on Vulcan green? Yeah. So, and... I also think, and I, I believe Connor Trenier has said this actually in interviews, I believe this was a wonderful environment to throw Trip into because mm-hmm. he's kind of like that country boy. Uh, he's Florida man, yep. I guess, actually, but he's like the country boy. And his sense of wonder, it's kind of like if you took someone, you know, I grew up in Alabama. If you took someone from rural Alabama who had never been out of the area and you go and you throw them in the middle of New York City, they'd be pretty surprised. Maybe not these days so much because you see everything on TV, but, yep. but you know, years ago. And you got that feeling. So, yeah, I really like the environment here. I, I do, too. And, and I really like the way that you kind of put that with the idea that this fits very well with Trip having this experience. And I, and I thought what was really nice was... You know, remember in Fight or Flight, Trip was so excited about the opportunity, you know, to visit the alien ship and he couldn't get enough of it and everything. And this mm-hmm. really kind of puts that to the test in the sense that he's put in a position that is much scarier for him. It's strange that this would be more scary than, you know, people hanging upside down and, you know, having their fluids pumped out. But apparently he's a big horror movie fan, which I think we find out later on that he likes those type of films. But you know, yeah. I, I think that's something that's really neat is that we have a character who's just so gung ho about getting out there and experiencing things. And now what we're going to do is we're going to put that to the test, even within a few weeks of that. And what we see here is that it does take Trip being talked down by Archer, which is to say, Trip, you've, you, you know, you went to Starfleet for this. We've, on to survival training this is what all that was for you need to give this a chance and and all those kind of things and i thought that that was actually really interesting because it's a it's a great connection already character wise yeah definitely and to continue what i was saying because i got myself off track a little bit there related to trip and what connor has said before i believe is i feel like this story sets his character up so well Mm -hmm. for them to write the character through the rest of the series yeah. because the way he responds to this environment really helps continue to shape the character and define the character based on what we've seen in these early episodes. But here it, because the focus is just on him in this episode, it really solidifies that. And I think it really defines his personality moving forward. Mm-hmm. No, I agree. And for, for me, it's an important story for that reason. Yeah. So I mentioned that in the beginning, they find a ship trailing them and they're able to detect that there's probably something there. And in the episode, they say, oh, they're using some kind of stealth technology because that's what humans of that time period would know because these days we have stealth planes. And But really, it's the first time, I believe, that we see a cloaking on the timeline that we see cloaking technology mm-hmm. in Star Trek because we don't see cloaks with the, you know, there are no Klingon cloaks in, in Broken Bow. And even though the Suliban have cloaks, I don't believe we saw cloaked Suliban ships in Broken Bow, right? We see them later. Right. 
No, I think you're so, 100% correct on that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's right. So that's the first introduction of a staple Star Trek technology, cloaks. And then once he's over on the ship, we get a really big one, which is the holodeck. Mm -hmm. And they don't call it a holodeck, but it seems that the holographic technology that the Zerillians have is on par with what Starfleet has in the 24th century. So they're quite advanced. And yes, I know that there was holodeck on the animated series for those listening who know Star Trek Inside Out. But I'm talking about the live action series, first of all, and then I'm talking about on the timeline as well. Mm Mm-hmm. I think this is a first for holograph, holographic technology. What do you think about these introductions of Star Trek staple technologies in the story? Yeah, I really, I like the introduction uh, of these things here. I think it makes sense um, and it makes it really interesting to see that Starfleet would be influenced by things that, and, and people that it meets along the way. Um, you know, like Tripp says that this is not like any holography that he's ever seen before. Right. And I think, you know, that's that's really interesting. Um, and it gives us a, a place to be able to go, you know, and it, it helps show that in many ways, not everything has to come from Earth in, in the Federation. Like they can be inspired by other species that have. Yeah, don't don't tell Chekhov that. Matthew, well, everything comes from a little old true. lady in Leningrad. <laughs> yes, that's true. Um, but, you know, I, I think that there's something really cool about that, that not everything is in, it comes from the Federation, that they could, again, be inspired by other races that they meet and the technology that yeah. they have. And and to me, that's that's really fun, honestly. What I find interesting is that the Klingons also – are not aware of this holographic technology. And they ask the Zerillians to refit the technology to work on the battle cruiser with their power grid. And it's n- not clear, you know, it's not established if within Star Trek if mm-hmm. Starfleet's holographic technology came from the Zerillians or was inspired by this encounter. You know, who knows? I, I think probably humans developed the holographic technology that we see on the holodecks independently of any encounter like this ultimately. And it's something that lots of species stumble upon themselves and develop. And and it's kind of similar. But it's kind of fun to think that maybe the Zerillians are the source of the holographic technology that we see among different races in the Alpha Quadrant and the Beta Quadrant and that the Klingons got it this way and that the humans got it this way, even if indirectly, even if it's from reports that Archer and Tripp filed. And then the engineers back on Earth said, oh, we got to get on to this. You know, we got to get Oculus 47 going here. It's sort of like in the Delta Quadrant, how no one had transporter technology. Yep. And then Voyager goes there and people start seeing transporter technology. You know that Many of those species, their scientists start, started looking like, oh, how can we do this? Mm-hmm. And probably if you fast forward 100 years in the Delta Quadrant, you'd probably start finding species that did have transporter yep. technology. Yeah, no, 100% agree. And I think it makes it just really interesting because it helps us be able to have fun finding out then the people that are going to influence Starfleet in the Federation as we move forward and again, I think what it does is it also kind of helps make one of the things, you know, a lot of people have made a lot of in Star Trek is this idea of everything being so human centric. And in that, I think one of the nice things about this is that we see that everything doesn't revolve just around the Federation and, and humanity. Things like holography in the way that we, uh, you know, see it here can be influenced by the uh, the species around them, the people that they meet, all of that kind of stuff. And so it makes it, to me, it just makes it more, uh, it makes it more fun 
I'm really glad that this episode spends the time to kind of show us some of these things. And, uh, you know, I thought it was kind of fun as well that this is not just for Starfleet, but this is all also for the Klingons as well. How do you feel about the timing of it, though? Because we talked about, I forget which one of these episodes we talked, maybe it was when we talked about Broken Bow, but how quickly familiar elements are being introduced to us. So this is the fourth episode of the series, and we're seeing that aliens can cloak their ships, and now we're seeing the holodeck. Do you feel like it's too quick? I I don't think so. And and part of that is because, you know, I one of the things that I think that this does is it helps us show that different species have different technologies that they they look to and that they develop first, you know, not everybody's on the same technology tree. And so Mm -hmm. what we uh, get here is there's a, there's gotta be a reason that they focused on this. Um, And, and if we had ever visited the Zerillians again, it would have been interesting to kind of get an understanding as to why they went with holography. Mm -hmm. We do kind of get the feeling though, because the food in their ship kind of grows on the walls of the ship and things like that, that they are in their ships for quite a long time. We get like, it's not quick for them to get from place to place maybe. And so that's one of the reasons why this is the case, which, you know, is really cool. And that gives you a good reason for why they would create holographic technology because, well, Mm -hmm. there's only so much to do on a really small ship you know their ship is like half the size of enterprise so yeah they they have less space so it makes sense why they would you know invent this type of technology right and and that's the reason for starfleet having it as well the animated series instance of holodeck aside when we first see it in the galaxy class starship in the next generation you know, one of the purposes, the Galaxy class was built for deep space exploration, long missions being gone, and the holodeck was a way for the crew to have an escape from the mundane life of living on a giant space hotel <laughs> for so long. But, but you know, that that's the, the purpose of it. So, yeah, and it makes a lot more sense, as you say, for the Zerillians being on such a, a small vessel for a long time. I think the, the fact that we see that it, this technology exists and how it's used, but it's not part of the enterprise. It's not something that our crew has access to. Makes it okay for me. If they had put a holodeck on the NX-01 or later in season one, they decide to build a holodeck, then that would have been a bit odd for me. Well, and, and I definitely think that would have been a place where you basically you jump the Porthos, right? I mean, you, this like that's <laughs> yeah. just way too far and makes no sense for where we are in the timeline because we know that that technology isn't going to exist until for Starfleet uh, and the Federation till sometime after Kirk, honestly. So right. I, I think they know themselves, but I think giving you hints of what's out there technologically for other species is fascinating. And obviously the Klingons get this technology before the Federation does because they take this technology from the Zerillians. Right. So maybe in yep. the end we get, you know, Starfleet gets that from the Klingons. Could be. That's some good head cannon right there. For sure. So once Trip is there on the holodeck and he's, you know, blown away by what he's seeing, but they sit down in the boat and he sticks his hands in some pebbles with Alen, who's the Zerillian girl uh, engineer who he's helping, and he ends up getting pregnant, but he doesn't realize that's what's going on, of course, and that's where the story kind of gets into the the heart of the story and plays out until the end. It's It's an interesting scene because, I mean, it can be read in many ways by different people depending on how you want to see each person's role in it. But for me, I see Alain is very intrigued by humans and curious about this alien species that she's never met before. And then Tripp, likewise, is very curious. And for him, the environment is completely new. And he has 
no experience with a situation like this, so he has no idea that anything could come from putting his hands into these pebbles. And I think it's an interesting way, yet again, to highlight just how unknown the depths of space are to humans and the things that they're encountering. We we talk about first contacts in Star Trek all the time, but when Kirk or Picard made a first contact with an alien race, especially Picard, sometimes it's with an alien race that's also equally technologically advanced. It's just the first time we've met them. But here, this is like really a first contact on many different levels, not only two alien races meeting for the first time, but like two civilizations whose knowledge and understanding of the universe is is quite different. And we see how innocent interactions can lead to unexpected things, as the title of the episode says. Yeah, I like that because this is something to which you know, unexpected, nobody expects to happen. And I I think what was, what's really fun about this is, is watching these, you know, two characters from completely different walks of life, completely different species, you know, learn to interact with one another and, you know, find each other attractive. And, and I I think there, I, I don't really know why people wouldn't like this episode it, part of this that i really find to be interesting is the fact that this this makes so much sense that this would happen and what i love too is that you know this is one of those things where not every single alien species we run into is going to be somebody we want to kill no there there are going to be alien species that we're you know going to be really comparable with and and be it uh, you know attracted to in many different ways technologically and, you know, even, you know, physically. And so I think to me, this was a really interesting episode for them to kind of dip their toe into the water of this idea of interspecies relationships with, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and Tripp is a perfect character to do that because, you know, he is so innocent here. He acts like a perfect gentleman and does his best to, to be right in line with everything that you would expect a Starfleet officer to do on a mission like this and yeah something crazy happens to him you know so (laughs) yeah what did you think about to reaction you just said trip was a perfect gentleman and it's pretty clear watching his actions on the screen that yeah he was but to really assumes that he's done something terrible her being a vulcan when i watched that I was a little bit surprised by her reactions. Did it seem out of character to you, even though we've only known the character for, for four episodes, but maybe in terms of of Vulcans? Or was it maybe a continuation of like what we saw in Broken Bow, where she feels like she has to really chaperone humans? Because Trip again, you mentioned in, in an earlier discussion about when the woman is weaning her child who can't breathe and Trip misinterprets that into polls trying to teach him about how things are different with different species maybe this is a continuation of that i don't know it just felt a little bit odd to me it it kind of felt more like somebody who is almost a little bit jealous uh and and um also it's that love hate relationship that to paul and trip have and so, I mean, mm. I think she automatically assumes the worst because of some of the experiences they've already had. You know, I mean, when you think about what just happened okay. last week, you know, yeah, um, yeah, it, it, when you put it in the that context of the last few months of their existence that together, you know, yeah. Trip yeah. doesn't have the greatest track record just yet, and so, and uh, yeah, I think I think she reacts in in a way of. She expected this to happen. She right. expected uh, Trip. This was to not screw unexpected. This. Yeah, this for was her. Expected. She expected Trip to screw this up somehow. Um, and okay. so well, that I, makes I think sense. that yeah. it's not unexpected for T'Pol that okay. Trip would do something stupid. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it, it it felt a bit like the the Vulcans looking down on the humans kind of thing again, which is part of the setup of the show. But yeah, that works. 
And another thing here, I'm thinking about episodes that we had in DS9 and Voyager, or even going back to TNG. You know, occasionally Star Trek would dip its role into the kind of evolution of the view of gender roles in society. And we have to remember that this episode was written and aired 20 years ago. So thinking was quite different at that point. And here we very much see just a woman can get pregnant, a man cannot get pregnant, but Trip gets pregnant. So they flip that idea on its head and then they use that to tell the rest of this story. And Mm -hmm. of course, sensibilities today are different in terms of genders. But I think here, this is an example of what Star Trek was doing since the 1960s of in its own way, sometimes gently trying to push forward thought and narrative on societal roles. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of the the points of this story, because this story is it has comical components to it, for sure. And Connor plays many of the elements of the situation that way. But I do think within the context of a science fiction story... This is a continuation of Star Trek's pushing social thought and boundaries forward a bit. And it really highlights, when you watch it today, it really highlights how far we've come in 20 years in terms of how society as a whole looks at these types of situations. Yeah, I mean, I think with the whole process of, and in, in the idea of any kind of roles, I, I think this was more in the writer's mind, a thought process of allowing Trip to kind of experience what would happen to and what does happen to many women, you know, when they do find out they're pregnant and they're they're working and what life is like when when everything gets upended, you know, um, Mm -hmm. to allow a guy to to be able to experience that same experience that many women all over the world have had. Right, which men cannot experience exactly. and cannot understand. Right. Yeah. So I, I think one of the beauties of anything is to is to put yourself in someone else's shoes. And this allows Trip to literally be in the shoes of of what so many women have gone through for so many years. I, I think that that's what the writers were kind of going for. Yeah. And I think, you know, it works because Trip is having to think about the thought process of what happens if I am then responsible for this child because there is no mother. We can't find the mother and it's just me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, as a parent, I found the scene where he's going through engineering and he's upset about the safety of things. You know, what happens mm-hmm. if a kid wanders through here? And I think anyone who's raised children, I've raised two. Mm-hmm feels that way as a parent. Like you you look at your environment completely differently Mm -hmm. and everything you see is a safety hazard and you're so concerned. And it is comical in the episode, but it's also very true Mm -hmm. as to that feeling and how you change suddenly, you know, when you become a parent or you will soon, you know, be a parent, you see things that way. I, I thought that Connor did a nice job of portraying that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I did too. I did too. Let's talk about the aliens here at the beginning. So fl- I say the aliens, I don't mean the Zerillians, Zer- I mean the aliens aboard the Enterprise flocks into Pole. This episode starts with one of the elements that I love about Enterprise, which is how they pair flocks into Pole and they share meals together and they talk. And they are the only two aliens on the ship. And whereas with other series, we've had alien characters such as Spock, you know, we've had Neelix, various characters, uh, you know, Odo being a great one on DS9, who see humanity through their eyes and they comment on it. And that's what we get with Flocks into Pole here. They're, I feel, important for establishing the narrative of the series in general. Mm Mm-hmm. And I also think it sets up this story kind of well, even with that short bit at the beginning. But like, how do you feel about how the writers use Flocks into Pole and in that capacity in writing these stories? 
I think it's really fun, and and obviously it's it's a hallmark of Star Trek to allow uh, alien characters to be able to uh, discuss how they feel uh, about our human characters and the way in which they do things as sometimes odd, strange, you know, any of those things from their point of view. You know, it, it allows us to be able to look at ourselves from another perspective. And I, I think, obviously, that's that's what Star Trek has always been about, is the different perspectives. And I think that makes it a lot of fun. And, again, what's fascinating is Phlox is the character who is willing to embrace everything about humanity and to try it all. And to Paul's on the complete opposite side, who wants nothing to do with it. It didn't agree with me. I tried it once. It doesn't. Yeah. So I, right, I right. think I think that's what makes this a lot of fun because two, we're also placing those characters in a certain position here at the beginning of the series, and we'll hopefully watch them move forward and watch them grow as we go throughout the rest of the the series. So yeah, it's. Mm-hmm. It, I always like when we have like a character like Phlox or T'Pol and they allow mm-hmm. us to see something that we wouldn't see if they weren't there. Yeah, I like the pairing in this one because if you take the original series, you've got Spock. And of course, Spock is half human. So mm-hmm. there, you've already got that component, except he really wants to be more Vulcan, especially later on. And then he has to find his humanity again. Because he has an interesting storyline, but he's one character looking in at what the humans are doing. And like you just said here, if we only had to pull, I don't think we would get the necessary um, look into humanity from the outside that we need because of her personality and how she views things, especially early on here in the first season. Phlox is he's one of my favorite characters in Star Trek, actually, because he knows so much about the world, but he's so calm and he's mm-hmm. really a counselor himself. And pairing him with T'Pol really allows that kind of like bouncing ideas off of each other, which I think is much more effective than just having a single yes. alien view looking in. Mm-hmm. So it's quite nice. Yeah, I agree. One quick thing I wanted to mention, which we didn't talk about a moment ago when we were talking about Trip. When he first went over to the ship, it was perfectly in line with his personality. And I also thought it was very interesting that he refused to rest when he came out of the decontamination. He wanted to just dive right into the work. And I think that describes a lot of the drive of humans to explore, which we've talked about is the foundation of the whole concept of Enterprise. It also reminded me of Scotty. You know, Scotty, you can never get him to take shore leave. He always wanted to get in the tech manuals. He always wanted to be working. And I kind of like that similarity between Tripp and Scotty as engineers of enterprises. Yeah, that's a uh, one of the things I think that is really fun about Tripp is the fact that he is willing to be involved. I, you know, I don't see him as, as that engineer um, who who just wants to kind of sit on the sidelines. You know, he, he mm-hmm. is excited. And part of that is because everything for him is new technologically. And, yeah. and to be able to experience uh, a, an alien way of, of doing something or a different way of doing something, you know, because humans are so new to this, right? And and the Vulcans haven't been sharing anything with them. So any chance that Trip gets to play around with alien technology is going to be really exciting for him and eye-opening, you know, in many ways because he has so much to learn. Yeah, definitely. I'd be the same. If they told me, you got to rest for two days before you can start working on the ship. Yeah, I'd I'd be trying to sneak out of the room. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Let's talk about one more element here before we head into our final thoughts. And that's the Klingons. Now, we saw Klingons, of course, in Broken Bow because they were central to the story. But here we see a Klingon battle cruiser, which was fantastic. I remember the first time this episode aired, it was really amazing to see that ship come on the screen. And the Klingons, there are a few things that are interesting to me here that I want to ask you about. One of them is simply 
do you think that we should be seeing Klingons this early in the series, given that they are humans' prime enemy through the original series on through the next generation? Uh, really, and and then we have the complex relationship that forms after that. But you know, humans—they've been out in space now for what you know a month or so, and they're still running into Klingons. Would you have saved this element, this race, for later? Um, that's a good question. Although I I don't think that I'm disappointed. I mean, part of the reason is is that because the Klingons are one of the nearest quote unquote neighbors to Mm -hmm. Federation space as we know it. So the fact that they're kind of lurking in these areas makes complete sense to me. And I think it works. And Klingons just make for a great foe. And I think what's also great is that we, you know, enterprise here is, is actually doing a good job of kind of showing that not every Klingon is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. These Klingons, yeah, they're kind of rough and gruff and some of those kind of things, but they don't just react with guns Mm a-blazing. They're not Klingons you can't actually have a conversation with. We haven't gotten to the place where Klingons and Starfleet are enemies yet, honestly. And I think that is really interesting to be able to see that be the case. And, and it gives us some room to be able to play with those different type of things. So to me, that's really exciting to be able to kind of like watch how we're going to get to that place in Starfleet and in the relationship between Starfleet and, and the Klingons, how it's going to devolve, basically. Yeah, that's true. Within Enterprise, I like how these early encounters between Archer and the Klingons shape the relationship between humans and Klingons for centuries to come. You you made an interesting point there that they do portray the Klingons a bit differently. And I had, in taking some notes to prepare for this, I had noted that contrasting the Klingons and the Vulcans in early Enterprise, we see Vulcans that are very different than the Vulcans that we know later. But the Klingons here are quite similar to the Klingons that we know later. And initially, I'm thinking they're not exactly the same, but they're pretty much the same as the Klingons that we see Mm -hmm. in the next generation. But now that you mention that, you know, it is true at this point, whether it's because the relationship has not devolved into the two species being actual enemies yet, Mm -hmm. or whether it's because there's something about the nature of the Klingons of the 22nd century such that in their society, something going on in their society hasn't pushed them to the point that we see them later where they're maybe more hostile than they are here. I hadn't really uh, made that distinction in such detail. So you feel that they are sufficiently different here that we are enterprises giving us a, a different flavor of Klingons than what we see in the TNG time frame. Yeah, I mean, because I mean these these Klingons don't have any relationship whatsoever with humanity. They kind of act indifferently towards humanity in many ways here, and I think that is different than the next generation time period where Mm -hmm. there is this long history and here they just kind of see them as a nuisance you know and and i think that is a different place and interesting and i love the fact that we will see the relationship grow throughout the seasons especially as you know obviously we get into season four where things will really pick up. But, you know, these early encounters with the Klingons, I think it it sets the stage for most of them just being kind of either blasé or kind of just annoyed with our existence. But Klingons, I I think that's the thing, is that the Klingons here also react that way to the Zerillians too. They just, they're kind of annoyed that anybody ever gets in their way. (laughs) And and that's a little bit funny to me. Well, they they definitely feel they're superior 
to races yes, that they're encountering. They absolutely do. Yeah. Yeah. And it would be interesting. Like, I don't think we don't really see this, but it would be interesting to see how Klingon Romulan encounters during this time frame Ooh, would have gone in the yes. series. Yeah. You know, someone who's more on yeah. equal footing with them. And mm-hmm. that would have been interesting. All right. Well, to close out, this is kind of a mix of final thoughts and a question. I wanted to ask you what you think about the critical reception that this episode got, because Star Trek magazine, which at the time was, I think, had a much larger circulation and was quite a bit bigger within fandom than it is these days. Or maybe I just feel that way because I'm in Japan and it's difficult for me to get my hands on it. And when I do, it costs about $28 a copy. But anyway, (laughs) Star Trek magazine at the time, they did this ultimate guide for the season. And out of five, they gave unexpected a rating of one. And they named it the worst episode of Enterprise's first season. Do you think that's fair? And why do you think they would have a reaction like that to this story? I think many people reacted to this story in that way because it's so lighthearted and kind of silly. And I (laughs) think people at this point wanted much more serious Star Trek. You know, they... They or they at least they felt like they did. They wanted much more depth, and and yet you know I think the the, the beauty of the way that this works is that this episode is slowly building, uh, and I think the fact that this episode is not so consumed with doing something outrageously amazing but really just kind of giving us some some good character moments to spend time with these characters and start to learn who they are and and what life is going to be like for them out here in space i think is great i think it's exactly what you need here at the beginning of the season so to me i've always liked this episode and i think it works really really well yeah the well, same for me but i think what you say is probably the case there are certainly fans who do not like any humor in their Star Trek, as evidenced by the reaction to Lower Decks that we see in social media among some people. And so maybe this, yeah, didn't it wasn't the right cup of tea for the writers of Star Trek magazine at the mm-hmm. time. I don't think yep. it's fair. I don't think it's the worst episode of season one you know it's not the best episode of season one but it's certainly not the worst episode so on that note what rating would you give unexpected i would probably give it uh like a three and a half you know like uh, because i do think that you know it's it's definitely not the best episode of course of, of the of the first season but i always have fun with this and and this is probably an, an episode that i rewatch more than others just because of the lighthearted nature it's kind of the perfect episode to be able to pop in and enjoy and yeah I, you know to me that's that's always really nice and and it's it's great to have any of these type of episodes throughout the series so yeah i'd go with three and a half all right. Well, I'm going to give it seven wrist nipples myself. Excellent. And for the same reasons that you say. And it's the kind of episode that I miss in modern Star Trek, where it is about character development. It gives you an interesting situation the character is in, but it doesn't have, like, the core of the story doesn't have a long term consequence to, like, some grand universe is going to be destroyed story that you're telling, but it really advances Trip's character. And it solidifies the foundation of the show, the premise of the show. All right. Well, that was fun to discuss, Matthew. And for those listening, if you would like to share your thoughts on Unexpected, we would love to hear from you. There are many ways for you to do that. You can join the Babel Conference. That's our listeners group on Facebook. If you go to Facebook and you type B-A-B-E-L, it should come up. If it doesn't, just type the Babel Conference. It is a closed group, so you do need to answer the questions so that I can let you in if you're not already a member. But we'll be posting 
uh, a discussion thread for this episode, and you can chime in there and talk to us and fellow listeners. You can also find us on Twitter, where our username is TrekFM. That's our username all around social media, including on Instagram, which Matthew maintains for us. And you can also go to our website and send us a message through traditional methods at trek.fm slash contact. That will come to Matthew and me by email. And speaking of that, Matthew, we received an email from a listener, Julie S. from North Carolina. And her subject was, Warp 5 is back! With an exclamation mark. And she says, Hi, Chris and Matthew. Would you believe that I started watching Enterprise for the first time two weeks ago? starting with Broken Bow. I then subscribed to Warp 5 to listen to the old episodes to get backstories and the like. Now being seven episodes in, you revamped the podcast and started right where I am. Amazing timing. I listen to many of your shows and look forward to each one. Thank you for your hard work, Julie in North Carolina. So thank you, Julie, for that message. And we'd love to hear from others listening. So please drop us a line. Yeah, that's great. I love the fact that uh, people are going to be joining us. So, you know, I think it's so cool that, you know, we do have people who are experiencing Enterprise for the first time, which is fantastic. It is fantastic. And I think there are going to be a lot of people like that out there as people look back at Enterprise now, not caught up in the the time, the post-Voyager atmosphere, and can just appreciate the show for what it is. And in addition to sending us a message... If you would like to leave us a rating and a review in Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or wherever you listen, if they give you that option, we would love to hear from you there as well. Now, Matthew, when you're not eating food that's growing on the walls in your house, where can people find you? Well, uh, you could find me all over social media under the name Matt Rushing 2 uh, And then, of course, you could find me here on the network, on the 602 Club side of the network, as we're talking about all of the fandoms we love outside of Star Trek. Of course, uh, we are over, God, gosh, 300 episodes now, 350 episodes. And uh, we've also got Snyder Cuts, as well as Assembling Avengers in that same feed. So some special short-run shows that we're doing for people to be able to enjoy. Literary Treks, as well as The Orb, of course. Literary Treks about the books and the comics of Star Trek. And, of course, we're doing The Orb together as we talk about Star Trek Deep Space Nine. And then over on the Nerd Party Network, doing aggressive negotiations about Star Wars every week with John Mills. And finished up Owl Post with Drea Kaufman as we talked about Harry Potter. Each and every week, we went through the entire series one chapter at a time. But, uh, Chris, where can everybody check out what you've got going on? Well, here on the network, in addition to the Orb and Literary Treks, which you mentioned, I have The Ready Room, which is my long-running podcast from 11 years ago, which I do with Larry Nemechek from time to time, talking about all of Star Trek. And we especially talk about the modern Star Trek series on there these days and the business side of Star Trek. And then I have Interphase, which I'm working on getting rolling again, which is a Star Trek Universe podcast. And elsewhere, you know, beyond what I'm doing on the network, I have my magazine, which is a business magazine about business in Japan for the American Chamber of Commerce. So if you're interested in reading my writing about business, you can find that on my Twitter account. It's probably the easiest way for you to keep track of what's going on there. And I also do narrated versions of all the stories in that magazine. So if you're interested in that, you'll find that there as well. And my Twitter ID is C Brian Jones. That's the letter C and Brian with a Y. That's my username pretty much everywhere in social media. So that's where I'm most active is on Twitter. So if you want to chat, I'd love to hear from you there. And then you can find me in other places like the Babel Conference. And if you would like to help us keep Warp 5 going in the 602 Club and all the other stuff that we're doing here on the network, we could really use your help through Patreon. If you'd like to support the network, please go to patreon.com slash trekfm to find out how. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash Trek FM. And I'd like to thank everyone who's supporting us now. Thank you to all of our associate producers and supporters of the network across all the shows. We really could not do this without you. All right, Matthew. Well, I'm looking forward to the next episode of Warp 5, where we're going to be going down to another planet to talk about Terra Nova. Are you ready to paint your face and get all shell? That is going to be an interesting conversation. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> All right. Well, are you ready for it? Let's go. <laughs> I was just picturing if this happened on DS9, I think Quark would start trying to make, he'd probably get together with Garrick, try to make some kind of wrist bras. Oh, yeah. Cover up those little nipples on the wrists. Yeah. Yeah. Something like and that. And sell I mean, those in Quarks. Yeah. Yeah. On wrist the bra. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Here we go. <laughs>